hello guys hope you all are doing well so in uh, today's session we will discuss about network address translation in Palo Alto so when it comes to NAT that is network translation and network address translation we need to understand why we need NAT so basically NAT came into picture uh, because of uh, depletion of public IPv4 address space that is the reason you know NAT was designed secondly uh, we can say NAT is also used as a security feature because it hides the real IP address of the system uh, in a sense uh, what do I mean by that uh, if uh, if you look at uh, IP address on uh, your host machine it is always on a private IP address range uh, I hope you guys uh, uh, you know know about private IP address and public IP address range so our host machine is always on private IP address range and when our host machine try to access any resource available on internet it cannot access that using the private IP address so it needs IP address translation that is it needs a public IP uh, to be translated and then only it can be accessed accessed uh, so that is the reason they are saying is it can be used as a security feature because when the system get accessed over internet it doesn't know what's the uh, you know real private IP address of your machine so uh, that's the reason it says uh, you know it's a security feature then uh, another use case we can say is uh, when we have a overla uh, overlapping IP address situation in that case also we can use uh, NAT to change source and de destination IP addresses so uh, in a case like let's say our source uh, our source and destination IP address those uh, you know those are in a same range or those uh, those IP address are same then uh, to get that working we can translate our source IP address or our destination IP address we will see uh, use case for that, uh, that in our lab right so this is a quick uh, you know intro about uh, NAT why it was there and uh, you know uh, what what exactly it's uh, used for right so next uh, we will take a look at flowchart for NAT so uh, it, it's uh, very essential to understand the flowchart of NAT um, because to understand the correct packet flow of how the packet goes to the firewall we need to understand if NAT comes first or security policy comes first and all those things so so if we look at this uh, flow chart give me one minute right so if you look at this flow chart uh, it says that the packet is received by the firewall here right then once the packet is received by the firewall it firewall determines if it's on uh, which interface and what's the zone that the packet is has came on so once that is determined by the firewall it checks if there is an existing session uh, and if if it if there is no existing session it goes to look for the route lookup so route lookup basically it does to find the egress interface so based of uh, doing a route lookup it determines the egress interface and egress zone once the egress interface and zone is determined it 
checks if there is any NAT rule on the firewall for that. So let's go to the case first that there is a no NAT rule. So if there is no NAT rule, then it comes and check if there is any source NAT rule. So if we say yes, there is a source NAT rule. Then it translates the source IP address and uh, port depending on uh, you know which uh, NAT types you are uh, which NAT types you are doing uh, depending on that it changes the source port that we will look uh, later in our slides and then once the NAT uh, NAT translation is done it uh, does check the security policy so it checks if there is a proper security rule there on a firewall to allow that packet and then once that's done you can see the session created on the firewall so this is how exactly uh, you know source NAT flow works then next case is like let's say let, let's talk about here like let's say it comes to existing sessions then it sees that there is already a session created for that so it doesn't go through all this path it directly updates the session timer here okay next one is if it does yeah it does a route lookup then it say it sees that there is a no route on the firewall you know so it directly drops it drops the packet here okay so then this is done then uh, uh, another case is let's say we have a destination NAT rule present so in that case it translates the destination IP address here right and then it checks if there is a source NAT present if if source NAT is present it does a source NAT if source NAT does not present it again comes to the firewall for security policy check for destination NAT rule if the if security rule is not present again the packet gets dropped so these are all the cases uh, uh, you know these are all uh, this is actually a packet uh, flow it, it goes through for the NAT address translation so you guys uh, I recommend you to keep all, uh, keep this in front of you whenever if there is any case wherein you need to troubleshoot the NAT it would be very uh, useful in troubleshooting it okay fine thanks so once this flowchart is done next we will look at what are the source NAT types so basically there are three source NAT type is a static dynamic IP and dynamic IP and a port so we'll take a look at this uh, NAT types one by one so first is static IP so why we need static IP what is the use for static IP so basically we can say that the static IP is used for one-to-one -one NAT in a sense it does natting for one one IP address to one IP addresses only so what it does it basically changes the source IP address while leaving the source port unchanged so there might be a cases that uh, you don't want to change the source port you know according to application behavior in that case you can use a static IP address also so what's the use case use case here it says that an internal server that must be available from internet so let's say uh, you have any SMTP server that uh, you want it to be reachable from internet right in that case you can NAT that particular private IP of uh, your SMTP server uh, to be NATed to particular public IP so it can be reachable over internet so this is about uh, static NAT then uh, this uh, this one shows how the static NAT basically works so in this diagram you can see that 
this is basically our uh, Palo Alto firewall here right so on this Palo Alto firewall you have one server with the IP address of 10.1.1.100 it's on DMZ L3 zone on interface ETH 1 slash 3 then you have a trust zone connected on ETH 1 slash 2 and this is untrust zone wherein the Microsoft server is there with IP address of 92.68.11.2 so what we are doing here is we are basically doing a static NAT for the server in a DMZ with IP address of 10.1.1.100 to 1.1.1.100 okay so we'll see how the uh, packet uh, how this uh, connection works actually so initially uh, when the packet comes to firewall you will see it with the source ip address of 10.1.1.100 like the uh, in this case the packet is going from this server towards the microsoft the one highlighted in the red uh, in this case you can see that the IP address is 10.1.1.100 and destination is updates.microsoft.com source port is a, a random port in this case they have mentioned it as 2020 and destination is 443 and then there is a data payload so once the packet reaches to the firewall here on the uh, left side you can see the source IP address is translated to 10.1.1.1 uh, 1.100 as it is mentioned here is the server is mapped to IP address 1.1.1 so on the firewall there is a NAT rule created to do this translation so it translates the source IP address to 1.1.1 and destination IP address remains the same source port you can see it is same it has not changed destination port remains same and data is again the same so this is how the packet looks like when it leaves the firewall okay so in another case if uh, you have a there is option called bi-directional so you just when you create a NAT rule uh, you just need to select one checkbox wherein it mentions mentions bi-directional so bi-directional is as the name suggests if there uh, if there is any connection that would be initiated from outside into the server in this diagram you can see that there is this pc which is on internet it's trying to connect to this server which is on dmz l3 zone so in that case we select bi-directional into the same rule so that it would allow the connect uh, it will allow uh, the traffic from outside in into the server so for that you don't need to create additional NAT rule right when you select the bi-directional it automatically creates that NAT rule for you you can check that using show run NAT policy and security policy for the bi-directional traffic you still need to create we'll check that in our lab right so let's check at uh, let's check how the packet looks like when the traffic comes from internet in case of bi-directional so this is the same rule we just uh, we, we are just doing a bi-directional for that okay so what happens is then this microsoft uh, server ip address is 92.68.1.1.2 it comes onto the firewall with destination ip of 1.1.1.100 that is the ip address it has translated so the return packet it came back and then destination ip is this one so source port is 4200 and destination port is 443 now the packet comes to the firewall the firewall uh, uh, looks at the source port it is the same destination it checks that I have a, a NAT IP address translation for this so it changes the uh, IP address from 1.1.1.100 to 10.1.1.100 which is the IP address of this server and then the translation happens and packet gets handed over to this server so source port and destination port again it remains the same in this bi-directional so it is basically a bi-directional 
uh, uh, bidirectional thing that you can allow with static mat right so once that's done next is yeah so a little bit theory on a bidirectional lat so basically it creates a appropriate rule for the traffic initiated in another in other direction right that is available only on source net rules and uh, as i mentioned you can see that uh, you can see that rule using command show run net policy yeah so there is uh, uh, some note that uh, we need to consider while doing configuration for NAT. so first one is security policy needs to be created based on pre net ip and port so whenever you write security policy you need to be sure that you are using a pre net ip and not the post net ip so pre net ip in the sense the ip before the translation and post net is the ip after the translation so that is like pre net ip and post net ip secondly when you men mention the zone it needs to be post net zone in security policy okay uh, second point we need to make sure is nat rules are evaluated from top to bottom so what do i mean by that so it, it's a case like like uh, you have a dynamic nat policy configured at the top right and then you are creating static nat policy in the bottom then your static nat policy would not get hit at all if your dynamic nat policy already covers it so you need to be careful in the order you are placing the nat rules as it is evaluated from top to bottom same like security policy we do so these are the two points uh, you need to consider when writing the security policy rules and nat rules right now uh, this is our lab that uh, we will do for static one as you can see from uh, this diagram it's a simple uh, one firewall with ingress zone wherein one host pc is connected on a subnet 192.168.10.1 and egress zone is connected on 1.1.1 range so in this case we will do the configuration in our lab and we'll see how the static nat looks like we'll stop this uh, video for now we'll continue this lab in a next session and uh, we'll see how it works okay thanks for your time you have good day if you have any questions please do comment i'll try to answer thanks have a good day bye